Welcome to this video on budget methods and format. The topics that we are going to cover in this video are budget philosophy and classification and budget types. The budget types that we are going to have a look at are traditional line item budgets, program budgets, performance budgets and so-called zero-based budgets. If you're thinking about a budget, then it is a mechanism to protect, allocate and control public resources. From an efficiency perspective, you may ask whether $1 allocated to program A equals $1 allocated to program B in terms of benefit. As we have seen before, it is difficult to value government goods and services in the sense that you may have multiple objectives, you may have conflicting objectives, and there is no common mechanism to measure and compare returns from various programs. Of course, there is also a difference between those who pay for a particular program and those who receive benefits from a particular program. If you're thinking about budget classification, then budget can be classified around three large categories. You could focus on inputs, basically on the purchases of the organization. Think about a budget where you are just focusing on supplies, equipment, labor and capital asset in the sense that you have a list of how much do you need for your agency and then you simply have a line, what is called a line item budget and we are going to talk about this later. You can also think about that the budget can be classified or categorized around outputs in the sense that you can think about classes taught or miles of road, roads maintained. If you're thinking about a city, then the city could measure of how much solid waste was actually managed or collected. If you're a police department, you can think about the number of arrests that were made. Those would be output measures. Or you can also center your budget around outcomes, basically the out accomplishments of the organization. If you're thinking back about the outputs, for example, from a police department, you can think about that arrests made would be an output, but what you really want to accomplish is actually the safety of people and property. The same is true, for example, for an education, for an educational institution, say a public school, is then you have the educational attainment of the population that is of importance. That would be an outcome. Organizations exist to achieve results. Now, in this video, we are going to have a look at four different budget types. We are going to look at traditional line item budgets that are mostly focused towards expenditures and inputs. We are going to look at program budgets that are organized around functions and programs. If you remember some of the videos that we have already uh, done, then the federal government is centered around functions. The third type that we are going to look at are so-called performance budgets. And performance budgets are oriented versus activities and out outputs. Now, within the category of performance budgets, we are going to look at the traditional performance budget focused on activities, and the new performance budget, which is focused on outputs or more precisely on outcomes. And then the last budget type that we are going to look at is what is called a zero based budget, where basically the budget is newly constructed every year. Now, let us look at traditional line item budgets. Traditional line item budgets the features of such a budget is basically that you have a list of spending per item. Think about a municipal library, for example. Then you are thinking about the number of books which you would like to purchase over the next years. Then you would simply write the number of books and then the per unit cost in order to construct your budget. Or you would think about the number of people that you are going to employ and the salaries and the fringe benefits associated with them. 
Now, traditional line item budgets are very much focused on inputs. It controls for the purchases and the use of inputs. Usually, there are th uh, three general cost categories associated with traditional line item budgets, in the sense that you have personal services, you have operating expenses, and you also have capital outlays. Now here is an example of an operating budget for uh, of a, a line item budget for a municipal library. So we first are looking at the operating income and the next slide is going to have an example of the uh, expenditures. When you look at the uh, operating income, you basically have the previous year, you have the current budget year and then also your budget request for the next year. You see that you have the various income or income sources like the municipality, the county may give you money, uh, state may give you money. You may also collect revenue from donations, fines and other uh, items. Now, in terms of expenditure of that municipal library, you would have the operating expenditures that are classified into various categories. You can think about the salaries and wages and also the employee benefits as being associated with uh, their personal budgets. You can think about books and periodicals as basically the, um, the asset investment or the investment in assets. And then you can think about like telecommunication, utilities, equipment, repairs, supplies, and so on as your regular operating expense expenditures. So this would be a very simple example of a traditional line item budget. Now, let me ask a question about this budget from a library. Then it does not, does it contain any information on how many books were checked out or whether the reading scores of children have increased? In the sense that the budget that we have seen so far does not tell you anything about the objectives or the outcomes from the library. And we are going to see of how this can be changed in the next couple of slides. Now, the advantages associated with the traditional line item budget are obvious in the sense that they're very easy. Those budgets are very easy to construct. They're also very transparent and they also are very good at controlling costs and imposing fiscal uh, discipline. The disadvantages are related to the question that I have asked before in the sense that there's a lot of attention on inputs and not on outputs or outcomes. There's no indication of supported services and programs and how this is actually going to uh, benefit society or the, uh, the, the uh, people in the, in the town. It is also focused on a single year as opposed to having a multi-year perspective of what type of investments need to be conducted over the next couple of years to increase the performance of the library. Also, there's no uh, what is called input substitution in the sense that if you're thinking that uh, if you're looking at a particular objective, then that objective may be better suited with a different input than with the inputs you currently have. So it is very difficult to uh, substitute one input for the other. Now next, we are going to have a look at uh, program budgets. Program budgets allocate resources to major program areas and the focus on expected results of services and activities. Think about budget organization around a common purpose or function and not around departments. For example, you can think about a common purpose or function being public safety. Then public safety would involve not only fire and the police department, but it may also involve the public health agency. In the sense that now you're not focusing on a traditional line item budget would focus on how many police cars would the police department need or how many, uh, how many employees or how many firefighters would the fire department need. But here in the program budget, you're now focusing on the overall uh, function of public safety and you are constructing your budget around those functions. 
Usually those budgets have a multi-year focus and there is a limited line item detail leading to greater flexibility in execution. What we will see is that line item details or line item budgets are still necessary and this will require what is called a crosswalk between program programs and traditional line item budgets. And there will be a separate video about this. So common program areas are public safety, public works, or for example, uh, human resources. Now note that those program areas are usually related to the organization's goals and also span multiple departments. Now, the features of the program budget are the following. You group agencies that are all contributing to a particular uh, objectives. For example, here we have done the example of public safety. And then each agency would identify their uh, products and their services that would fit within the uh, goal of or within the program of uh, public safety. The agency would then also use a crosswalk to connect the line items or the costs uh, of the agency to provide or to contribute to program objectives. And those crosswalks or those, uh, those cross crosswalks would then be used to connect the line items to the program objectives. Those, those uh, program budgets then also allow to identify the cost and the benefit to allocate the resources across the various departments. And the goal, the overarching goal is to reach the program uh, programs or objectives. Now, there are advantages associated with the program in the sense that it leads to competition among alternative approaches to achieving public purpose and are not organized by uh, organizational units. It also focuses the government provision of goods and services. There is a focus on society and not necessarily on the inputs used as we have seen before with the municipal library uh, example. So staying with the example of the municipal library, that could be, for example, the objective of a city to increase the educational attainment among children. And that could be done via funding to the public school, but also via funding of the municipal library. So in the sense that those two agencies or entities would be linked in the program that is increasing the educational achievement among children. Now, the program budget, there are also disadvantages in the sense that you basically have to construct uh, two budgets. You have on one side, you have the line item budget that is associated with each agency. But then that line item budget has to be translated into a program budget in order to uh, achieve the objectives. Usually, a traditional approach of budget construction has been uh, traditional line item budgets. And hence, those program budgets, budgets represent a shift in, uh, in, in tradition and basically breaks with uh, legislative and administrative uh, uh, traditions. Sometimes it is also difficult to classify the various, uh, to find a common classification for functions and programs. And note that, of course, this is uh, very important if you were to switch from a traditional line item budget to a program budget before you can do the switch, you would have to think about the uh, identification of goals and objectives. And there would also have to be uh, stakeholder inputs. And this may be very uh, controversial and there would have to be a lot of uh, consensus. Now, let us next look at the so-called performance budget. Now, the basic element or the basic elements of a performance budget is basically the identification of service levels through the use of so-called performance measures. And then we are allocating the resources to various programs within an organization, and we are focusing on the achievement of those performance measures in the sense that the budget construction is centered around the uh, 
performance measures that are laid out and decided beforehand. So at the end of the budget cycle, you would think about whether when you have allocated a certain number of dollars to a particular activity, let's call this activity A, then you are going to ask yourself whether the allocation of money has actually contributed to the achievement of performance measures that are related, that should be triggered by the activity A. If the, those performance measures have not been achieved, then maybe there needs to be an adjustment of resources spent to that particular uh, activity A. Performance budgets are also represent a shift in the budget paradigm in the sense that it is really now focused on outcome measures. Okay, or you have the focus on results, uh, outcomes and the impact of government expenditure. Next, we are going to have an example about the city of Sunnyvale in California. And here we are going to look at those uh, performance measures. So first of all, the city of Sunnyvale has uh, public safety programs. And you can see that here the Department of Public Safety has, for example, police services, fire, community safety, personnel and training, etc. Also investigation services. Now, when you look at their budget, and we are going to do this in a, in a bit, then you have what are called workload indicators. For example, you have the number of traffic enforcement stops, you have the number of parking and traffic citations issued, you have the number of uh, traffic complaints addressed by enforcement uh, efforts, or also you would have the number of police, police responses to emergency events. Now those workload indicators basically tell you of how, what the activity of the various depart uh, of the various uh, departments are. Now, when you're thinking about the performance indicators, then you can see that they have uh, the average police response time to emergency events or the average police response time to urgent events. And for each of those performance indicators they would have benchmark val values. And then if those benchmark values are not uh, fulfilled with the current budget or with the current allocation of resources, then there would be a change in this allocation of resources. Let us have a look at the budget from the city of Sunnyvale in California. Here we are going to focus on the Department of Public Works. First, you can see that the budget information is categorized into various programs. So for example, you have a program of transportation and traffic services, you have pavement and concrete maintenance, you have the maintenance of street lights, signs and debris. You would also have a program on urban forestry, parking lots and so on. The total operating budget across all those programs is about $52 million. And there are also uh, projects and equipment. So think about this as capital investments of about $1.7 million. And hence the total budget here of this Department of Public Works for this city is about $54.2 uh, million. Now let us have a look at a particular subsection of the budget and those are the pavement and concrete maintenance. Now there are two sections here. We have what are called uh, workload indicators in the sense that we have the miles of collector and residential streets within the cities. And then we also have the uh, feet of displaced uh, sidewalks that need to be uh, maintained. Now those are workload indicators, basically saying of how much uh, work is there. Now what is more important for the performance budget is of course the performance indicators. So here in the top part, you can see a list of those uh, indicators. And let me just pick out, for example, the average citywide pavement condition index rating with a goal of 80% or higher. And you can see that over the years, the city was below 
80% of their performance goal. And now the city has a, a target for 2023 of achieving the 80%. Now note what you will see in this budget as well for also the other programs is that the responsiveness of the city or the responsiveness uh, of, uh, to residents is also very important. So for example, here you have the performance indicator that says the number of resident survey respondents and percentage of survey respondents rating the services provided by the pavement operations for street repair as good or better. Okay, so now this would be an example of a performance budget. As mentioned before, before performance budgeting is a budgeting approach that focuses on achieving specific performance outcomes and results rather than just allocating funds based on historical spending or incremental changes. In general, performance budgets are widely used in government and the public sector, but they, they are also applied to the private sector. There is an emphasis on outcomes and objectives, and they, they have to be clearly defined in order for the organization to achieve their goals. These outcomes are typically linked to the organization's miss mission and strategic priorities. But of course, at some point, the outputs or the outcomes have to be linked to the activity or the unit cost associated with a particular uh, activity within organizational units. There is also the need to establish uh, performance indicators in the sense that you have to think about the workload, for example, the number of customers served or the number of streets that need to be maintained. And we have seen this in the Sunnyvale budget that is listing at the beginning of the budget for the public works department of how many miles of streets are there actually within the city that need to be uh, maintained. There's also a focus on efficiency in terms of what is the cost per unit of roads that need to be maintained. So we have seen, for example, in the Sunnyvale budget that they are looking at the pavement condition index that needs to be over 80% within the city. Then you would have to figure out or you have to calculate of how many city streets are below 80% and what is the condition of those roads and what is the cost per unit to actually uh, move those roads that are below 80% to 80% uh, or higher. Now, of course, with the, unlike with every budget, you have uh, advantages and disadvantages associated with the traditional performance budgets. So the advantages are clear that you have a higher level of uh, accountability because you can demonstrate uh, activities and service levels. And it is also uh, information for internal management and it allows for cost containment. Okay? The disadvantages is, or the disadvantages on that there is a higher cost of uh, budget preparation because it entails more effort in putting the budget together. And it also exposes certain operating details. So, for example, if you're thinking about the number of uh, the number of police vehicles or the number of uh, snowplows within a city, or how they are deployed, then the budget would give you a performance budget would give you indications about those details. Also, the performance budget, of course, relies heavily on the quality of the performance uh, measures. And we are going to have a look at those performance measures in a bit. Now, there is also what is called a new performance budgets. And here are some uh, principles. Basically, how the new performance budget is constructed is that you start off with a strategic plan and you state the objectives in this plan. Then you are developing uh, outcome performance measures that are congruent or that are consistent with the strategic uh, with the strategic plan it turns out that the new performance budget leaves a lot of flexibility to agencies of how they actually spend the money as long as they are able to achieve the 
objectives or the performance measures, measures that were established before. At the end of the budget cycle, you would be uh, reporting and auditing the out outcomes, whether the objectives have been met or not. And you're not really focusing on the, the amount of money that has been spent, but whether the objectives have been or the outcomes have actually been uh, achieved. Now, let us talk a little bit about the uh, outcome measures. Now, those outcome measures are uh, specific uh, policy goals or uh, objectives. And those outcome measures are used as a mechanism to allocate uh, resources to the various activities, to the various agencies, uh, or even the various programs. And those outcome measures should be directly linked to the mission statement that you have established in a first, first step. Now, it is important that you are not having a large number of objectives or outcome measures, because otherwise it may get very difficult to determine which outcome measure is actually uh, important. And then you also have the issue if you have too many outcome measures, that managers will find it very easily to achieve some of those outcome measures, even if those outcome measures are not necessarily important. Now, even more specifics about the outcome measures, there should be certain characteristics those outcome measures fulfill. They should be clear and uh, unambiguous, and it does not necessarily mean that they are uh, quantitative. They should also be uh, relevant and appropriate to the objective. And it's not just that you are using a particular outcome measure that is available. That also relates to the last point here where we are looking at the observable and measurable. Of course, if you're thinking about a particular outcome measure, then it is good or it is, uh, it is positive if that outcome measure is actually uh, available but you cannot come up with an outcome measure that is actually not measurable or that you could not uh, that you could not observe of course those outcome measures also require the consensus among a various a, a wide number of uh, different stakeholders Just think about the various operating agencies uh, the administration or even the uh, citizens within the uh, city. There should also be a means that the outcome measures can be collected in an unbiased uh, manner, in the sense that those are uh, objective. And this relates to the first point on this slide where the outcome measures should be clear and uh, unambiguous. Now, there are challenges associated with the new performance budget in the sense that it is very difficult to compare agencies in terms of performance. For example, we have seen before the uh, rating, the, the public works department of, the, uh, of Sunnyvale in California, that they are, one of their uh, agency uh, performance goals is actually that the roads or the road, uh, are in good condition, in the sense that the pavement condition index is above uh, 80%. Now, it is very difficult to compare that performance measure with, say, the performance measure in the public safety department. Okay, They may have different uh, performance measures, and hence it's very difficult to compare the performance measures between agencies and then also determine of how resources or funds should be allocated among uh, agencies. There could also be the danger that the performance measures may be uh, May, may fulfill uh, political agendas in terms of how the uh, measures are uh, selected, or how the data is uh, collected, and so on. And then, of course, it is also difficult to audit the, in terms from a financial perspective, because the auditing usually requires that the uh, financial statements are in uh, are in good shape, and hence if the budget is more focused on the uh, on the achieved goals and not necessarily the money spent, there could be also some uh, difficulties. Now, the difference between the performance budget and the program budget is here uh, a difference in focus, in the sense that uh, performance budgets are really emphasizing on uh, management efficiency of achieving uh, certain goals, and the program budgets uh, emphasize the benefit uh, to an governmental unit uh, from the uh, expenditures, okay? But both 
the performance budget and the program budget use indicator to measure their financial and operational uh, performance. Now the last budget type that we are going to look at are uh, zero-based budgets. Now basically what zero-based budgets are is that you have to defend the entire budget uh, annually in the sense that there is uh, no automatic base uh, to start from and that the entire budget has to be uh, constructed uh, on a yearly basis. Basically, the zero-based budgeting is an approach where every expense must be justified and approved for each new budgeting period, uh, typically on an annual basis. So in a zero-based budget, there is no assumption that any expense will continue automatically from the previous budget period. Instead, each line item uh, in the budget starts at zero and managers or budget planners uh, must provide a rationale for why each expense is uh, necessary and how it contributes to the, to the organization's goal. <laughs> now, there are advantages to uh, zero-based uh, budgets in the sense that you are on a yearly basis, you are you can consider alternative uh, delivery uh, de alternative delivery devices, in the sense that you can uh, think about achieving certain uh, objectives with a completely new change in approach or activity. In the sense that it encourages uh, decision makers to allocate uh, resources to areas that provide the greatest uh, value. Zero-based uh, budgets also have uh, the advantage of resource efficiency in the sense that uh, every expense is uh, scrutinized and zero-based budgeting can lead to uh, resource op optimization in the sense that it identifies uh, inefficiencies and opportunities for cost savings. There are, of course, also uh, disadvantages in the sense that you have a significant effort in the budget construction and not all programs can be zeroed out. Okay, so you cannot, for example, you cannot think about uh, zeroing out um, uh, public road maintenance. And hence, there is also an uh, implicit uh, path dependency. So we have seen about those various budget structure that they can be uh, oriented towards input inputs, which is great for uh, resource accountability and uh, fiscal discipline. They can also be focused on outputs that would help manage agencies with the management and control. And we have seen with the performance-based budget that we can also have an outcome focus. So for example, the uh, reading scores of, uh, of children. Okay, But of course, the performance, bu performance budgets are very difficult to measure. And it is also very difficult to come up with uh, initial performance uh, performance measures or outcome measures, and then um, to control of what exactly the government needs to do to provide those uh, or to achieve those goals. <laughs>